Toki a? Mi anke kan san. Mi wile pana e sona pi Toki Pona. Hey, I'm Greg Dan 3, and I want to teach you about Toki Pona. Today, we're going to be talking about modifiers, the ways you can specify more clearly what you're talking about, as well as P phrases to get even more specific about the ways you modify different words. And we're going to start with our vocab. So, for starters, we're going to talk about the new particle P. It is drawn with this corner shape facing toward the bottom left, and it is spelled P. I. What it does is it regroups modifiers that follow it. And now, what's a modifier? That's going to be the topic of the entire lesson, but in short, a modifier is a word that modifies another, following it and changing its properties. They're very similar to adjectives in English. So, P regroups modifiers. Next, we have Ona, drawn similarly to me or Sina. Ona being drawn toward the side, it's spelled O-N-A, and it is about third persons of any kind. It can be he, she, it, they. It can be any sort of third person. It's often used to reference recently referred to objects in a previous sentence. Then we have ni, drawn with a downward pointing arrow. And ni, spelled in i means this, that, these, those. It refers to some object you could point out, or a recently referenced idea, or a coming referenced idea. Next, we have ale, drawn with an infinity symbol. And it is spelled A-L-E. You'll also see it spelled A-L-I. Next, we have Mute. Mute is drawn with three vertical lines, and it's spelled M-U-T-E. Mute refers to a lot of something. It can be a very, very large number of a thing. It can be a large amount of a thing. Making something more intense, more powerful, more strong, it increases the word it modifies. And then we have... Suno. Suno is drawn as an abstract representation of the sun, a circle with one line at each of its cardinal points, the top, bottom, left, and right. Suno is spelled S-U-N-O, and you might be able to guess, based on the picture, that it refers to light or the sun, any kind of light. It can refer to the small glow of a firefly or the absolutely awesome power of the sun and all the light it gives to the earth. And then we have a bunch of words to do together. For starters, there is kule, drawn with a triangle symbol, and that has a line near to its top, K-U-L-E. Kule refers to all kinds of color. It refers to color as a concept. And then we have lasso. Lasso is drawn with the same triangle shape, now without a line, and then two little leaves sticking out of the top. It's spelled L-A-S-O. And lasso refers to both blue and green shades of color. Next, we again have our triangle symbol and the symbol for mouth. And this is loye, L-O-J-E. This refers to shades of red. Next, we have our triangle symbol once more. And then we have a circle and three lines around it. And you'll recognize this as having been just introduced. This is, of course, the symbol kule and the symbol suno, as in color and then the sun. This word is yellow, J. E L O, and it refers to shades of yellow. Then we have wallow. Here we start with the triangle symbol, but instead of drawing a line through it, we draw two little lines coming out of its top two sides. This is wallow, and it's W A L O, and it refers to shades of white, things being pale, 
And then we have Pimea. And that is our triangle symbol. And then an X through it. That's P I M E J A. It refers to darkness, shade, shadow, and colors that are dark or black. And that is all of the words for this lesson. So let's talk about the most prominent grammatical feature of this lesson, the modifier. So as I mentioned before, all of the words in Tokipona can be modified, and they can be modified in every part of speech. So we're going to talk about how to do so. We're going to do just a phrase. This phrase is lipu, and then musi. So when you see two words side by side like this, what you get is that you read them from left to right, and the leftmost word is the head of the phrase. And then any words to its right before the next grammatical position are modifiers. So here, lipu, meaning paper or document, is modified by musi. We can draw a little arrow to clarify that. Now, as a quick note, there's actually multiple ways to write modifiers in the Sitalen Pona. For example, we could write this lipu and then draw inside of lipu musi. And this would have the same meaning. Our lipu now has musi inside of it, and this is still modifying lipu. And then in a similar vein, you could write lipu, particularly small, and then musi directly above it. And both of these ways are methods for writing modifiers in Tokipona, in this writing system. You read them from the bottom up in both cases. All three of these ways of writing this phrase are the same. They do mean the same thing. So now let's go on to a few sentences that involve modifiers. Let's say we have the sentence, Yan Pona Li Toki. For starters, we recognize that Li, right here in the middle, is the start of the predicate, right? And so Toki is our predicate, and Yan, being all the way at the front, is our subject. So that leaves Pona here to be a modifier for Yan. So this Yan, that's a person of some kind. Pona, well, that's goodness or simplicity. So this is a good person. Li Toki. They are speaking, having a conversation. This could be anything from my friend is talking to some good people are having a conversation, a discussion, a debate. Most critically, this Pona here is telling you something about Yan. It's a little bit similar to saying Yan Li Pona, Yan Li Toki. Next example, Mi Sona Suli E Lipu. Now, let's break this sentence down. For starters, our subject is Mi. Mi here is the subject, and you can tell it's not being modified because it's the very first word of the sentence, and there's no li later on in the sentence. You'll get used to this idea where, generally, me without li somewhere in the sentence means me is definitely the subject. And the same for sina. Mi sona suli e lipu. We have this idea of sona modified by suli. Let's think about what this relationship could mean. Now, it could be saying that the sona, the knowledge, is large or important, right? But what does that really mean? Well, this could be saying that this knowledge is deep, thorough, or important. This is kind of like an intensifier for sona. And for what it's worth, there's other words that could do this too, like wawa. You could substitute these and get a similar result. But, most importantly, this is some kind of sona suli, right? And we're saying, mi sona suli e lipu, I deeply or thoroughly understand the document, right? Let's say we break this sentence up into two others, clear wawa here. Let's say we break this sentence up and see what comes of it, how it reads. Let's say, mi sona e, now we want to clarify that the sona is suli, 
And we can simply write that. Sona li suli. Now, while this does work, and we can say the second sentence is talking about this original sona, kind of like a modifier, it's also less clear, right? This first sentence clearly does say, mi sona elipu, and get at most of the same idea of the original sentence. But this second sentence, sona li suli, this could be a general statement about knowledge itself being important. It isn't necessarily about this original sona, even though context might tell you it is. And so you can see the utility and the help of modifiers here. The modifiers now let you know this sona right here, this is a suli kind of sona. And we can write that right in here. Mi sona suli e lipu. Let's go on to a really big sentence. Kulupu mi li pakala wawa e kiwen suli. Kulupu mi li pakala wawa e kiwen suli. Reading this sentence over, it may be a little overwhelming. So let me introduce a strategy for managing this. It's actually pretty easy to get an idea of what a sentence means in Tokipona even if you ignore the modifiers. We look at just kulupu. Where is the next head noun? Ah, here's li, so the very next word, that's a head noun. And then we look ahead to e, okay, that's a head noun, kiwen. And then we can read just those together with the grammar. So we see kulupu, li, pakala, e, kiwen. Now that's a lot easier to parse, isn't it? Let's say the community, destroys a big slate. Some kind of rock, some kind of destruction, some kind of group. Now that we have a general idea of the sentence, we can look back to the modifiers to get a more specific idea. Well, this kulupu is kulupu mi. So it belongs to the speaker. This is my community. Then we have pakala wawa. This is again the idea of a kind of intensifier. In this case, wawa is making this pakala more powerful. Not just, oh, I've broken it. I have destroyed it, shattered it, exploded it into a million pieces, right? And then we have e kiwen suli. This is an enormous rock, right? So altogether, we've painted a much more colorful picture of what's going on with these modifiers. And so, as far as interpretation, you would interpret this something like, my community exploded an enormous boulder, right? And, of course, we can go through the exercise again of breaking this down into multiple separate sentences. We already demonstrated one in which you view just the head nouns. But the thing is, when you have enough information to give in a sentence, it can be pretty unwieldy to try and go without modifiers. You'd have to say three, four sentences to get across this entire idea. All right, let's go over the idea of having multiple modifiers in a single phrase. Let's say, mi sona e wawa nasa lete. Mi sona e wawa nasa lete. So of course our heads are mi, sona, and wawa. But the modifiers here on wawa are pretty important. We have nasa and we have lete. So this is some kind of power that is weird and is cold. Some kind of magical ice power, for example. But wait, there's two modifiers here, right? Does the order matter? No, in fact. If we were to say wawa lete nasa instead, here, we're actually still expressing the same idea. This is still a ice power, a weird ice power, a magical ice power, if you will. And the order of the adjectives doesn't really matter. And you can observe this in English as well. You could have a green old knife or an old green knife, and though one is more comfortable to say than the other, they do mean the same thing. And the same goes in Tokipona. The modifier order does not matter. But there is one more case where modifier order does matter a bit. And it's with that word I mentioned all the way at the start of the lesson, P. So let's have a look at that. Let's say, 
mi, yan, pi, pali, kasi. This word pi is introducing a new head noun, but it doesn't introduce a new grammatical position. It's just a modifier of an existing grammatical position. It takes all of the words that follow it and turn them into a single modifier. And so if we look into this P phrase, we see pali and then kasi. So this kasi is modifying pali. And then this entire P phrase goes on to modify yan. And so what we get here is that the speaker is describing themselves as some kind of person. And this is a kind of person that has to do with plant work, work, creation, plants, maybe a gardener or a farmer. Let's look at another sentence that's similar, that gets at another P phrase idea. Mi, yan, suli, pi, sona, kasi. So we can look at our P phrase here and see that the head noun is now sona and it's being modified by kasi. But we also see a modifier back here at the start of the predicate, suli, is modifying yan. This P phrase also goes on to modify yan, and we can look at each one. A sona kasi, that is some kind of plant-related knowledge, and then a suli, importance, largeness, and these two are like having two separate modifiers on the same one word. But one of the modifiers is, of course, more than one. And so you could say this is an important person, and this person is also related to plant knowledge. You could say they're a botanist, some kind of person who researches plants. This suli and this entire P phrase are equally important, right? They modify the head noun equally. Now, I'm going to go over a quick writing note about P and how it's drawn in the Sitalenpona. And while I do so, I'm going to talk about a bit of grammatical importance. So that example I had before, yan, P, sona, kasi. Here in this case, although I've drawn P a little bit long, I've instead drawn P underneath all of the words it modifies. This is another valid way to write P. You can write it as an underline to everything it contains. But here's an interesting thing about the way P works and a little recommendation. In each phrase, limit yourself to a single P phrase. The reason why is because there's a bit of a disagreement about what it means to have multiple P phrases. So here we have a Yan P Sonakasi P Wawa Mute. So this brings on a question. Do these P phrases from left to right contain each other, as in you might draw the line like this, or do they go on to modify the head separately, as if they did this, drawing arrows? The answer is nobody agrees on it. And so for clarity, you should stick to a single P phrase in a single phrase. It's much more clear when you do so. And for this purpose, let's say, Ona, li, yan, pi, sona, kasi. And then, separately, ona, li, yan, pi, wawa, mute. You can always separate multiple P phrases into separate sentences. Let's go on to a couple of examples translating from Tokipona to English. Let's write a sentence out on the board, and we're going to explore a context that sentence lives in. Ona, li, pana, e, kasi, laso, loye. Now, we have two modifiers here on kasi, so pay close attention to that. Let's look at a context. One of your friends has been confiding in you that they honestly have no idea what to get for their partner's birthday. You quietly talk to some others and bring back some suggestions for gifts and surprises and tell them to your friend. Finally, you tell everyone the plan your friend went with, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, that everything went okay. And you say, Ona lipana e kasi lasso loye. They gifted red and blue flowers. Very important note about this sentence. The two separate modifiers, lasso and loye, both independently modify the head noun. This kasi is both lasso 
and loye. And that's why the translation is red and blue flowers. It's not some combination of red and blue, because otherwise you would have to have the color as the head noun to be modified. Let's go on to another. Lipu, P, loye, yelo, li, yo, e, sona, mi. We can look back at our head nouns to get a better idea of what's going on. We have a lipu, a yo, and a sona. So let's look at the context. Let's say you've been writing down your thoughts and feelings in a journal. As a sort of meditation exercise. Unfortunately, you lost it recently. So you call up your friends and explain what you lost, what's important about it, and what it looks like. Lipu piloye yelo li yo e sona mi. The orange document has my knowledge, my understanding. You're describing, of course, the appearance of it. We have a P phrase that goes on to modify the head here. And you're describing the importance of it. It has your knowledge, your understanding, your feelings maybe, right? Now, importantly, you need to have a color as the head noun in order to modify it. And so here we have loye being modified by yellow. And of course, the result is that we actually change the color. We change the understanding. This loye is also yellow. And of course, when you mix red and yellow together, you get orange. And so this is actually some shade of loye yellow. All right, let's talk about more than one sentence put together. Let's say, pilin mi li ni. And then separately, ona li kute sona e mi. Pilin mi li ni. Ona li kute sona e mi. Of course, being two separate sentences, we have a little bit of room for interpretation because they're providing context for one another. First, a pilin, some kind of emotion that belongs to you. This could be like your idea, your thought in mind. Li ni. You're now referring to some future referenced idea. Ona, some third person. Li kute sona, knowingly listen, e mi. Let's look at a context. Let's say we have a teacher who is struggling to calm down her classroom. The teacher comes in with a new plan for each class, but the class stays rowdy and unwilling to listen. But finally, the teacher turns learning into a group activity where each student learns one specific thing and then they teach it to their partner. And then when asked how the activity went later, the teacher responds excitedly. Pili mili ni, ona li kute sona e mi. I think, my feeling is, they understood me. They listened knowingly to me. And you can, of course, imagine the excitement, right? We're going to do one more Tokipona example, and this one will be simple. Kule kasi li ante. Very simple modifier right here. Kule kasi. But it gets an important idea out there, which is that kule can let you refer to kinds of colors that aren't present in Tokipono's vocabulary by default. Kule kasi, you might imagine green by default, but let's look at the context. As the air gets cooler and the sun is out for less time each day, you begin to notice that the leaves on the trees are changing color turning beautiful shades of red and gold. In your excitement for the changing seasons, you tell everybody you know. Kule kasi li ante. The color of plants is changing. And of course, that's a very literal statement, but it gets at a very important idea. Again, you can refer to more colors and these colors aren't static. If I say green in English, there are multiple things it could refer to, but if I say the color of plants, that can change. Here, they're referring to the idea of it literally changing. All right, let's do a couple of English to Tokipona examples. Let's say we have the sentence, I want the shiny white rock. So of course, our subject right here is pretty clear. I, first person, that's me. Want is a kind of wile. So then we have 
the shiny white rock. Rock is pretty clear, so let's put in e kiwen. But we still have modifiers to get at, right? And these modifiers, shiny and white. Well, shiny, if it were bright in appearance, for example, we could say suno, and then white or pale, for example, that's walo. So we have mi wile e kiwen suno walo. Let's go on to another. All of these are strange feeling. We are, of course, talking about the idea of a physical feeling, of the act of touch, not emotion. But of course, in Tokipona, those two ideas are united into one word, peeling. All of these are strange feeling. These and all of. Well, we know that in English, of is a kind of way to shuffle around your adjectives, right? So all is an adjective of these, and these is a kind of reference, right? It's the plural of this, right? And this, or that, that's ni in Tokipona. Now, all, we have a specific word that lets us express that all of something is occurring, or all of a thing is present, or we're just referring to all of any particular collection. That's alle, ni alle, li, and then it has some property. Okay, strange feeling. We could put strange as our head noun. We could put nasa, right? Or we could put pilin as our head noun. Let's think about both of those. If we put pilin here, we would get something like all of these are touching something in a strange way, right? But really what we want is all of things are being felt and the feeling is strange, right? Ni ale li nasa pilin. Let's do another example. They are making a guide to explosions. That's a fun one, right? The first part of this is actually pretty easy. They, that's our third person pronoun, so that's ona, are making. Well, making, creation, working, that's pali. Ona, okay, third person, fli, pali, and then they're palying something, eh? But what's a guide to explosions? Well, a guide could be a physical booklet, and let's start with that. Lipu, and then a guide could also be a kind of knowledge. So what if we modify lipu with sona? But what's this knowledge about? Well, this knowledge is about explosions. So what if we wanted to make it totally clear that this is a book about explosion knowledge? Then we could say lipu p sona pakala. Ona lipali e lipu Pisona Pakala. They are making a guide to explosions, a document about explosion knowledge. Let's do the rundown. We know that we can change the words in every part of speech with modifiers, making them more specific, making each word more specific. The word at the start of the phrase is called the head after its head position in a phrase, and we have a new particle. P. And that, of course, can be used to regroup modifiers. It's one of the only ways that modifier order matters in Tokipona. The grammar is, fortunately, still the same. We can say subject, li, predicate, e, object. Now, very important note, modifiers do not change what they modify. We can say sona, lipu, well, that's still a kind of sona. We can say suli, wawa, is still a kind of suli. The head noun is the end-all, be-all of what the thing is. It gives you the most amount of information about 
what the thing is. And of course, you can see this in English too. If you have a blue book, that's still a kind of book. And if you have a deep understanding, that's still a kind of understanding. All right, that is all I had for this lesson. I really hope you learned something. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good one.